So my name is Ian Urbina. I'm a reporter at The Times, have been there since um, 2003. And I do investigative projects, um, and that was always sort of my dream when I joined the paper, um, and have been doing that for about five, six years. And essentially what that means is um, I have the luxury of time uh, with stories. So I'm not a beat reporter, and I don't have to sort of sprint every day to help fill the page, feed the beast, as we say. Um, I can uh, um, go longer and work on things. The expectation, though, um, that comes with that luxury of time is that you um, uh, will uh, find virgin snow um, topically, uh, and you know, which basically means old topics, but a new angle on them, um, or new information that previously wasn't disclosed, or both, uh, and that you know there'll be um, a level of polish and a level of rigor in what you produce that is um, higher than would be expected from someone that's you know has three days as opposed to three months to produce. <clears throat> so, this series was one that I had pitched. I'd been, you know, kind of um, fantasizing about doing, getting the gray lady to pay to send me to see. Um, had long been kind of um, a dream of mine. Um, in grad school, I worked on a ship. Uh, and since I was a boy, I was always sort of fascinated by um, the blue on the glo globe um, and sort of the little specks in the middle of the ocean, who lives there, and how do you get there, and what's it like being a teenager there, and can I ever go there? Um, so um, I had pitched the notion um, of our doing a series on this uh, several times before. It's insanely expensive and sometimes dangerous. And um, so um, previous editors had kind of looked at me quizzically and said, you know, OK, what else you got? You know, and, um, but this editor um, liked the thought uh, and um, essentially said, Sure, you know, write me a memo. Let's see what story ideas um, we would actually do. Um, and and the pitch was really simple. It was just this thought that um, two thirds of the planet is covered by water, and um, much of that space is ungoverned and ungovernable, um, in my view. And wouldn't it be amazing if we could take um, our readers out there um, uh, to that space, a place that they probably have never been and may never get to go? And um, just talk about the what happens out there. Um, and the import is, you know, 90% of everything we consume comes to us by way of sea. Um, you know, 50% of the oxygen we breathe comes by way of sea. Um, uh, and um, it's just a strange kind of last frontier. Um, you know, the commons, the tragedy of the commons, outer space. Uh, and international waters, or and Antarctica, you know, there are a couple places around that man, people can access that doesn't belong, that sort of belongs to everyone and no one, and the high seas are one of them. Um, so that was the thought, that was the pitch. Um, my editor um, uh, liked it, um, and off we went. It quickly became a little bit more specific. It wasn't just sort of let's go out there and see what's out there. It was more. Um, let's look at the um, range of bad behavior, the crime that occurs out there, and not just um, environmental crime. Um, in fact, when I first pitched it, um, as I left the office, sort of shocked that I had made it past first base on this, um, as I left, my editor, her name is Rebecca Corbett, um, uh, said, and by the way, you know, I, um, yeah, we can, let's think about an ocean series, but I don't want any fish. I remember thinking, I turned back and said, wait, so you want a series about the oceans but no fish? Um, and what she, and this was brilliant in my view, um, what she meant was, you know, that space out there is covered often as an environmental story um, and for obvious reasons, but let's approach it, we can back our way into that, but let's approach it as a human story, a labor story, a human rights story, um, and uh, look for um, those stories primarily. Uh, and then secondarily, um, uh, look at the space as a kind of, uh, you know, kind of marine realm uh, that we're depleting and despoiling. Um, so I'm going to blitz through. Um, there are eight big stories. I think I'll probably get through maybe five of them. Um, I can't imagine anyone ha working here has enough time to have read them all. So um, uh, I'll just talk about sort of what my goal was. Um, uh, tactics were, findings were for each of the stories, um, and then I'll, I'll stop.
Um, so when you're going to do a big series, um, uh, you often, and you're, you're sort of planning out how to do these things, um, the first story in a series is often referred to as the throat clear. And it needs to be, um, you know, it's, it's clearing your throat to get the attention of the room. In this case, you know, kind of you're reading public. And so it has to be kind of at an altitude that's much higher in terms of its perspective and sort of a authoritative tone and a level of polish that's you know beyond the rest of the pieces because you really kind of have to establish kind of the corners of your canvas. Um, so this first story um, aimed at that. Uh, and it had at its root one kind of core um, uh, conceit, if you will, um, from a writing perspective. And that was, my thought was, um, rather than uh, having a person as the main character in the story, um, let's have a ship as the main character. And let's find a ship that is um, a uh, well-documented and repeat bad actor and kind of a poster child of scoff law behavior at sea. Um, and so, and, and then sort of let's just follow that ship as it goes around the planet and does bad stuff. Um, and so I kind of had a, beauty contest, if you will, the opposite of a beauty contest, an ugly contest for like the, the contestants that we might choose from for this main, for this story, and looked at a bunch of different really well-documented bad ships where bad stuff had happened. And the Don Liberta, it's called the Sea Pearl in this picture, and you can go in on some of these photos and sort of blow up the actual photo um, uh, and maybe scroll through some of the photos. Um, it says the Sea Pearl now, it's, it's renamed, it's actually since been renamed again. Um, but so the Don Liberto was the one that won the contest, and it won because um, uh, it had engaged, and you want to jump past the autoplay one and scroll all the way down. Um, uh, it had engaged in three categories of crimes um, that struck me as either really compelling and dramatic, um, uh, and or um, pervasive and important. Um, one was abuse of stowaways. So the story there is this. Um, uh, the Don Liberta is a small ship, Greek-owned. Uh, at the time, it was Italian captained, uh, mostly uh, Romanian crew. Um, uh, it's called a mother ship. It's a refrigeration ship. It mostly transports uh, tuna. Um, from fishing vessels to shore between countries. Um, real rundown, broken down ship. Should have been retired decades ago. Um, and uh, uh, there are a couple places in the world that have um, uh, robust stowaway communities, um, repeat flyers. Uh, and Cape Town is kind of top of that list for a bunch of reasons. Its port is porous. A lot of really big ships come in and out of there. A lot of poor countries in the neighborhood that put out these guys. They're all guys, or at least all the ones I have ever read or interviewed. Um, uh, and so there's a robust shanty town that's just stowaways, you know, or kind of aspiring stowaways, or just returned stowaways, or um, right in Cape Town, right near the port. And um, so Don Liberta was in port in 2011 in Cape Town, these two Tanzanian guys, uh, one of whom had stowed away a couple times before, once or twice quite successfully, landed someplace nice, stayed there, got a girlfriend, a job, you know, undocumented, had a life um, way better than what he was living before, and then got, you know, caught by immigration, sent back, tried it again. Um, that was one guy. The other guy had never done it before. They team up. They sneak onto the Don Liberta. They hide out in the engine room. They make it, you know, a couple days. They're discovered, brought up on deck, and the captain says to the crew, "Deal with them." Okay, so let's pause there for a second. That moment in the movie is kind of an important moment conceptually because post 9/11, the world became scared, um, and regulations came down. All, you know, in every realm, airports, et cetera, including ports. And port, one of those regulations was you show up with guys on your ship that aren't supposed to be there, you're going to be hit with huge fines because of terrorism concerns. And so all these ports sort of implemented these re regulations that had hefty fines. The fines go to the company. The company passes the fines down to the captains. And the captains say, you guys are responsible for the sweep of the ship before we leave port to make sure that there are no stowaways. And if you guys don't do a good job at that, um, it's coming out of your wages if we get hit with the fine. The fines can be fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000. These guys make forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. It's serious business. 
So the Tanz our Tanzanian guys somehow slipped in, didn't get nabbed. So the captain in a very and the captain turned to the crew and said something that we had heard was said often in this situation post 9/11. You guys deal with them. I don't want to know how. Deal with them. What that means is get rid of them. And the more humane way you get rid of them, you know, obviously there's some instances where they deal with them by the book. They bring them back in port. They take the fines, et cetera, et cetera. There are also sort of other ways, which are um, you just kill them, throw them overboard. Um, and then there's the middle ground, which is you try to humanely deal with them by doing what happened to these guys, which was they built a raft, tabletop raft, about eight by eight, no handles, real flat, drums underneath, um, oil drums, put it on the water, tethered to the Donald Bertha, way off at sea, bring the guys up from lockdown, say, climb on board, they cut the cord. And storms coming on the horizon, Don Liberta steams away. These guys are out there, don't know how to swim, and they're sort of holding on. I'd heard about this in incident from an Interpol source and thought, wow, that's dramatic. Um, we didn't know the name of the guys, the stowaways. Um, we didn't know much. Um, so thus began this scramble to figure all that out. We got lucky. And the raft survived out there for a while, washed up in Liberia. Both guys were alive when they came to shore. One of the guys was in bad shape. He died 24 hours later. The other guy survived. And that was crime number one and reason I was really interested in Don Liberta. If we could find that survivor guy and land his story, that's kind of cinematic drama um, and important news because in the 9-11 moment, it's an um, interesting problem and also part of the lawlessness at sea concept. Second crime that Don Liberta engaged in. Uh, every three years, ships intentionally dump more oil and sludge into the oceans than the BP and Exxon Valdez spilled combined. Okay, so think about that, how much coverage there was of those two accidents. And then think about the fact that intentionally, the sheer quantity is every three years put into the oceans. The oceans are a big place, dilution's real, but it accumulates. A lot of this stuff doesn't biodegrade. Um, so I thought, when we crunched those numbers and found out that statistic, I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty striking. The Don Liberta was caught on satellite doing just that. It's something called a magic pipe. A lot of ships have it. It runs from your engine room under the ship, and it's essentially a flush. You know, it's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to bring the stuff back to shore, have it processed, costs. Uh, a lot of folks have magic pipes installed so they can get rid of the waste cheaply and disappear it. Don Liberta had a magic pipe. They caused a 90-mile slick off the coast of Africa, caught doing it on satellite, category two. Category three, less dramatic, very pervasive, abuse of mariners, of deckhands. And it's low-grade abuse in terms of the drama scale. It's wage theft and it's abandonment. Um, but it's a big problem. Most of these crews, we're not talking about Captain Phillips Maris container ships. We're talking about Don Liberta, shitty, smaller kind of craft that really make up the true numbers of people and ships out on the world's oceans, not US waters, but the rest of the world. Um, and what happens often with these companies and these ships um, is the corporate structure is like, it's kind of something out of you know, a crime movie. It's like a P.O. box registered, a guy who doesn't exist, licensed in Nigeria, owned by a guy in Greece. You know, like it's layers upon layers and intentionally designed to be impossible to figure out who actually owns that company that owns that company that owns that ship. Donald Banter was a textbook example of this, papers and companies on top of companies, some of which don't even exist. And what happens often in these cases is these, sh you know, uh, a ship rolls into port or comes into port. Um, it gets hit with some fine or some unpaid bill catches up with them, or the mother company, you know, is moving money around and you know hits some problem. And overnight, it becomes in the interest of the company to basically disappear. And cut their losses and walk. And so they do that, and the corporate structure is almost built for that. But there are guys on the ship out there and, you know, wherever, and they're kind of at a loss. You know, um, a quarter of the world's mariners are from the Philippines. Interesting backstory as to why that's the case. But most of these folks are third worlders, okay, developing world crew. 
So they don't have the resources, they don't have the lobby, they don't have the lawyers, they don't have anything to really kind of logistically figure their way home. They're on a ship that no longer has an owner. They can't get any calls answered. They don't have the money or the papers to get off because they're on the coast of the US or Europe or Africa or wherever. They're not allowed off the ship. They're a mile offshore and they're in port sometimes. Um, and, they, and the ship can't move and leave because they don't have the fuel. So they're stuck. And these stories get very dramatic. Guys have died, starved to death. A lot of guys have tried to swim to shore and they can't swim. They get they um, drown. They sneak into country. They get nabbed for immigration, et cetera. Big problem in the seafarer world. And the Don Liberta had engaged in this crime um, repeatedly. So we tracked down one of the former crew in this tiny town in Romania um, who had experienced just that. So that's the Don Liberta. And that was sort of the kind of the first story in the series. So why don't we pull out and go to the second story. So I reported these differently than, I, than we published them. Um, and this second story was a story that I reported towards the end of the process. Um, and I bring that up because in the course of reporting these other stories, the Donald Bertha and others, um, I kept hearing about just this insane level of violence at sea. And there were a couple of things I kept hearing or inferring. One was the type of violence that we know of, the sort of Captain Phillips, you know, RPG, fast boat, Somali attack on Western well-endowed you know, kind of merchant vessels is a tiny, tiny, tiny sliver of really what happens out there in terms of incidents, in terms of bodies, in terms of dollars lost, um, in terms of just brutality. Um, uh, but it's kind of what we consume in the Western world. It's dramatic, and it's the story that made it onto the silver screen. So it's what we all know. And it was a real, real problem, 08, 09, 010, but kind of has subsided since then. The real realm of violence is the Don Liberta, you know, kind of level of ship. And it's places you wouldn't expect. Bangladesh, the waters off Bangladesh, probably some of the most violent waters on the planet. Bay of Bengal, um, this area called Sunderbands. If you actually look at the numbers of kidnappings, you know, a hundred a time, you know, put in these villages um, and held for ransom. Uh, South China Sea, um, coast of West Africa. These are some really brutal places, and it's usually fishing boat on fishing boat, big boat on small boat. Um, fuel vessel, localized gangs um, who specialize in this. Um, it's armed robbery at sea, um, and is they're kidnapping rackets. OK, point one. Point two, um, so the type of violence, the target of violence, um, the motivation of the violence um, was different than kind of I thought the public realized. And number two, um, uh, the Captain Phillips narrative was actually often used as a cover for other types of violence. So, and I'll f explain that a little bit more in a second. So I, I wanted to do something on violence, but, but when you're gonna write a 5,000 word story, you can't write an article, you have to write a story. It's gotta be a narrative or else your reader's not gonna actually sit with you unless they're like a professor of such and such and they care a lot about it, but that's five people. If you really want real people to read it, you know, then, um, you have to make it a narrative. So this violence one was really tough. I couldn't figure out how to make it a narrative. I don't think I achieved it, but I wrote an article. <laughs> um, but the thing that did land in my lap that made it a pretty striking article was this video. So I was on the South China Sea for six weeks, a photographer and I, probably the mo reporting the um, a separate story, the sea slavery story. And I got an email from a, um, a kind of spooky law enforcement type who I've known for a long time and trust, and he trusts me, and he sends me stuff. Um, and he's a real serious guy. Um, he never pops into my inbox unless it's something pretty heavy. We work together on sex trafficking of minors, global kind of really brutal stuff. And um, so when the email came in, I'd been on out in the South you know, on boats in Indonesia and Borneo for a while, and I was kind of worn out and emotionally at wit's end. And um, the email subject line said, brace yourself. And I remember thinking, that's like really superlative language from this guy, you know? And I thought, if he says that, then what am I about to open in this video that's in the email? And what I, what was, so I thought for a second, should I open it? Of course I did. Um, 
What it is is a 10 minute and 26 second long video. It was on a cell phone. It was found in the back of a taxi in Fiji by a student. Um, the student saw it, started scrolling through it, saw this video. The video shows four men in the water, can't tell where, we figured out where, um, kind of flailing about trying to get away. And in the surrounding are four large ships. They turn out to be tuna, Taiwanese tuna longliners, big ships. The guys in the water are brown, grainy, cell phone video, can't make out ethnicity exactly, but they don't look Scandinavian, put it that way. Um, and there's wreckage, wooden wreckage in the water, and some of them are clinging to it, others are trying to flee. And what proceeds in the 10 minutes is um, killing, a brutal killing, where someone with a semi-automatic who's behind the, the camera um, essentially takes these guys out. You know, it takes some work, it's not a great shot, but headshots, a lot of blood. Um, and um, at the end, you know, as if that wasn't bad enough, um, there's a celebration with the deckhands where they all kind of cheer and kind of, and they pose for selfies. So I get this video and I think, okay, well, there's my violence story. You know, I'm going to investigate the hell out of this video and figure out what happened if we can. Um, so we did. And that's, well, we'll look at a quick clip of it. Um, uh, but um, the real crime, in my view, occurred after um, we published the story, which is not before, even though we went to Fiji, we went to Taiwan, we went to all the relevant players, you know, and leaned on them and brought diplomats to bear and the State Department and Interpol and all, you know, every pressure tactic I know to get a government to step up and do something about this. None of them were willing to investigate it. Um, and then after the story, we thought, okay, this will shame a government into doing something. To this day, no government's been willing to investigate. Not because it's so hot or scary, or you know, this isn't the melee massacre or anything, but because no one cares, really. I mean, um, crassly put, more sophisticated is to say, it kind of gets to the nature of the high seas. You know, on a ship, you have maybe 10 different nationalities. Um, you know, it's owned by, you know, it's tied to three other countries. And the people on board, either the deckhands who are conducting the crime or the victims of it, are typically poor and um, not the types who have a government that's going to go to bat for them. And in this case, what was interesting, now we loop all the way back to Captain Phillips, the governments that we really leaned on, Taiwan in particular, Fiji also, said, we've looked into it. We didn't open a formal investigation, but we looked into this. We looked at the evidence you have, um, and we've come to the conclusion that the guys in the water were pirates. Okay. The guys in the water are, you can see the front of one of the Taiwanese two longliners in that picture. Um, the guys in the water could be Attila the Hun's cousins, for all I care. There's no way that those guys are still threats. This is murder, period. Um, uh, and so it bring, brought me back to something I had been inferring for the entire year of reporting, and now is like a perfect example of it, where piracy, Somali piracy, the fear of, the rhetoric around it, was now being used as a pretext to not do anything about something that was clearly a murder. Um, uh, so um, that was the core ingredient of that story. And because I'm way over time, I'm, I don't think we'll watch the video. Um, uh, but I encourage you to keep me employed and go to the website and click there. Um, uh, the other thing that was in this story, and again, it was not a narrative, it was sort of a hodgepodge, was something else that struck me as fascinating, and maybe you guys too. So um, post 9-11, a lot of new rules came down around the world, including in the maritime space, one of which was, um, well, let's do it the other way. So post 2008, 2009, Somali piracy, serious problem, more attention, big players getting hit, uh, scary stuff happening, and the industry, shipping industry, turned to governments and said, we know you've long, i.e. two centuries, had a policy of you know, discouraging um, weapons on board. Everyone's got guns on board, but kind of discouraging the conspicuous display or use of armed power on private vessels. Okay. But we're getting our ass kicked here, and uh, we need some help. And government said, okay, we'll look into it. And then governments looked back to their Navy guys and realized they had reduced their Navy power and their jurisdictional issues and all sorts of, 
They're like, we're not in the business of doing law enforcement. We're, we're kind of protecting geopolitical issues and other stuff, but we're not cops. And so governments turned back to the industry and said, look, sorry, you got to deal with it yourself. Literally in six months, a $20 billion industry emerged, black water on the ocean. So the private maritime security industry was born in 12 months and became this massive industry. And it was a lot of ex-soldiers, a um, fair number of British American ex-Iraq, ex-Afghanistan soldiers, and a huge number of um, Pakistanis and Sri Lankans. Sri Lankans are a really interesting story. They like got ahead of this, partially because of where they are. They're real close to a lot of the rough neighborhoods. But they like cornered a big chunk of the market. Um, and a lot of Tamil targets, anyone knows Sri Lanka, you know, a lot of demobilized Sinhalese government soldiers and a lot of former rebels who had training and arms went into the business. And that's some of where the worst behavior is coming from, including the shooter in this video. At least that's what I concluded and others concluded. But so on the one hand, you had governments in writing, including the US government, turning to the industry and saying, OK, arm yourselves. You need guys with guns. So companies emerged, and they had guys with guns, four-man teams initially, then insurers said three is fine. Now we're down to two-man teams, and most of the guards say that's insane. Uh, you know, some of these ships are two, three football fields large. You know, um, and when they get hit, they get hit from four different boats, different directions. Two guys cannot handle that. Um, so they said, arm yourselves. Okay, that was one. One phenomena, 08, 09. The other phenomena was post 9-11, ports saying, no guys with guns. Like all over the world saying, look, we're afraid of, Mumbai was hit by guys on boats. Okay? And uh, there was just a general fear of like, terrorists coming by boat. So the world said, OK, we've got to figure something out. OK, on the, the port guy, what do you suggest we do? I say we have a new rule that says no guys with guns come in our national waters. National waters are 12 miles from shore. Okay, International start at 13. So all these countries pass these rules, no guys with guns. OK, so what happened? You got lots of guys with guns and no guys with guns allowed. So what they started doing in the first 12 months is they just dumped the guns, keep the guys. So whenever they entered, you got stuff, grain, fuel, Nike shoes, whatever, uh, Apple computers. They come into port, dump the guns at 13, sink them, come into port, unload, come back out. There's a gun dealer at 13, 14, 15, buy new guns, off you go. It was cheaper than dealing with all the red tape and so on. But then like, some smart entrepreneurs were like, that's crazy. We got a better system. So they, they created this business called floating armories, which are these boats, which are usually 13, 15, 20 mile out. And they're just one part bunkhouse one part gun depot. And you essentially take your guys with guns, you unload them, they stay there in between deployments. And it's this weird place, you know, like, of course I want to get there. You know, like that's what I'm in the business of doing is finding weird places and trying to get there. And so a photographer and I went to some of these floating armories and stayed there, partially just to access the guards and hear what they had to say about violence, but also just to see what this niche business was like. Um, and also what it could tell us about the types of violence that are out there, the types of arms dealing, et cetera. All right, so that's the hodgepodge two, number two story. We're at 28 minutes. I'm going to stop at 40. Um, the third story was a story about sea slavery, which is sort of a loaded term. Um, and it generally refers to, in the maritime space, trafficked and or child and or forced and or indentured labor on boats. Okay. Um, think of it as a spectrum, right? So you've got soft to hard. On the soft end, um, you have maybe um, indentured. Okay. So that is what that looks like. Let's, uh, so a couple of points. One, uh, a lot of attention has been paid to sea slavery in the last 20 months. Good attention. Um, it's worthy of it. It's mostly focused on the South China Sea and Thailand, which is where we went to. That's a problem, because truth be told, um, this is a global problem. You go off the coast of Falklands, you go off the coast of New Zealand, go off the coast of South Korea, you go off the coast of um, West Africa, Bay of Bengal again, Indonesia. 
uh, you will find the same and worse problems of this. And what it looks like, but Thailand's a really interesting case, and here's why. Thailand is essentially a middle class country. It's got less than 2% unemployment. If you're Thai, you don't take jobs in the shit industries. So you won't find Thai women, for the most part, in the sex industry. And you won't find Thai men, for the most part, on fishing boats. But those two industries are the biggest money makers in Thailand. And they depend almost entirely on Cambodian, Loatian, Burmese, Rohingya, import, undocumented, indebted labor. Okay. Um, those surrounding countries are super poor, super unstable, and big outpushers of people, right? So um, what we had heard was um, there was an interesting intersection between sort of environmental and labor issues in Thailand and everywhere, but Thailand was a great place for it because what you had was in the last two decades, there's been so much overfishing close to shore that the stocks of fish are depleted closer to shore. It's, it's, you, you can take two days to catch what it took two hours to catch two decades ago. So ships were having to go much further out from shore to reach quota. Um, and uh, there's a point at which the economics don't make sense, because fuel is your biggest expense. And if you get so far out, you can't catch enough fish to break even. So that is what led to something called transshipment, which is essentially a system where these fishing vessels, big ones, like your tuna ships there, um, Transshipment is a system where the fishing boats go way out, 200, 250, 300 miles from shore, and they stay out there, and they just keep fishing, okay? And they don't come back in. And mother ships, like the Donna Berta, go out. They bring ice, fuel, food, parts, drugs, women, you know, and out, and they bring fish back, labor. And the, the, the vessels just keep fishing. What we had learned was that if you want to find really egregious, like, yesteryear type slavery, go to the transshipment vessels. Go way out. Those are the ones where, because for obvious reasons, they're, they're staying out there. They're way beyond the reach of any government, and they're just fishing the whole time. So our goal, the photographer, a guy named Adam Dean, amazing photographer, as you can see, um, and I was to see if we could get on those vessels. And it took some work, took a lot of time and luck and you know, rats and roaches and, you know, like, um, but eventually we got out onto several, one of which was the one that we really profiled, which was a kind of textbook example of this model, which was four officers, all Thai, one bosun, he's your middleman, on a plantation, he's the guy that is, he's, you know, of the ethnicity of the forced labor, but he answers to and gets to stay in the big house. So the bosun on the ship, and he is, always going to be of the ethnicity of the crew. And the crew is never going to be the officers. So on these ships, the officers are all Thai, only speak Thai. On this ship, the, the crew of 40, mostly boys, some men, um, all Cambodian, all indentured, two Shanghai, okay, meaning went to a bar, talking up a prostitute, passed out, next thing they know, they're on a ship. Um, and the bosun is Cambodian. So he speaks both Thai, and, and he's the guy that you know, beats people and kills people and does it. Okay. And I say kills people like in passing. So in 09, just so you don't think I'm being hyperbolic, in 2009, the UN did a survey of this demographic in the South China Sea, these boats, escaped crew, rescued crew, um, and found that 59% of them, this was a peer-reviewed kind of vetted survey, 59% of them had witnessed murder by officers on crew. 59%. I've done coal, trucking, sex trafficking, like really dark spaces on the planet. I've never seen the level of brutality that you'll find on these types of boats. So we went out and made it on this boat and spent time out there and essentially sort of documented how'd you get here? What's work like? You know, what are the conditions? Um, uh, and this story was a close look at the problem of this kind of labor and sought to, whether we achieved it or not, go read it, you'd be the judge. But um, also sort of explain it from the captain's perspective. Like, why are you so insanely brutal and do you kill people or beat the hell out of them if there's even the slightest kind of hint of um, insubordination? Um, why do you think it's fair that 
you can take a person, what we would call slavery, what do you call it? What they call it is a simple labor contract. A broker came to them. Um, the kid came to the border with the, with the trafficker. The kid didn't have any money. And these are kids. I mean, you look at these pictures. Captain said they're all over 17. I don't know how well you can see these. Um, but uh, you look at the paces on these kids. They're 13, maybe. Um, uh, and there, the captain's view is, look, I paid the labor broker, the trafficker, $400, huge amount of money, for this guy. And I'm out that money. This guy is going to work for me to, earn, to pay back that debt. Now, of course, what's ridiculous about that is you leave port. There's no like bookkeeping. Hey, you know, Johnny, you earned 20 bucks today. We're working. You leave port, you're on that ship as long as it takes. So for example, in this same story, we not on that ship, but a prior ship, um, we focus on one guy named Langlong. Secretary Kerry and others have sort of picked up Langlong's story and run with it, which is great. It's what you want as a journalist. But Langlong was this very well-vetted case um, that we found of a guy who was shackled by the neck for two years at sea, sold between three different boats. Um, standard kind of, he's Cambodian, came in through traffic or thought he was getting a job in construction, ends up on a boat, et cetera, et cetera. Tried to escape when a mothership came out, jumped over, tried to, got brought back on board, and whenever he wasn't working, he was in a shackle. So, and this isn't me saying it, this is the, uh, a separate mothership came out, and the guy saw that and said, what the hell is this? And proceeded over the next nine months to report back to an advocacy group, the Thai government, and negotiate the purchase of that guy off the ship. Uh, and Lang Wong was someone that we, whose story we landed had in the story. So um, anyway, so this was um, the third, three minutes. Uh, the third story in the series, um, probably the, one of the toughest to report. So let's pull out, and let me just figure out what would be the best one to move to next, and finally. So let's do that one. Um, this, was, um, this was one of those stories that you almost kind of are a channel for. Like, I didn't write this story. This story wrote through me. Um, uh, it was just a great yarn. And it you know, spoke to larger issues about lawlessness, but here's the story. So I, again, I got a call when I was out uh, at sea. I had a cell phone. I got a call from a source, a law enforcement person who um, knew I was on the market for really good maritime stories. The person said, have you heard about this chase? No. It's the longest chase in nautical history. And it's a law enforcement chase, but there are no cops involved. I said, okay. I'm sold. Like, how do I get on it? You know, is it going on now? Yes. OK, so the story is simply that, uh, you know, there's this group, you guys probably know them, Sea Shepherd. It's an offshoot of Greenpeace, a more radical direct action group. They're on the show Whale Wars. You know, they've had all sorts of run ins with the Japanese government. Well funded, Hollywood kind of backed, uh, um, mar you know, sort of marine advocacy group. They have a bunch of ships. And um, they, kind of conducted an interesting experiment, which was, so Interpol has a list called the Purple List. And it is um, the list you get on as a ship if you're really bad. And it's, you have to work to get on the Purple List. Um, but it's an arrest on site list. And at the time, there were only seven ships in the world that were on the Interpol's Purple List. So that's how. And essentially, if you're on that list, every country in the world is supposed to stop you. No one ever does. Okay. The top of that list was a ship called the Thunder. And the reason it had top ranking was because it had earned $67 million worth of money you know, um, poaching, um, stealing fish from places it wasn't supposed to, mostly from Antarctica, mostly Chilean sea bass, more commonly known as toothfish. You buy it at restaurants and high-end restaurants, um, hotels. Um, so the Thunder, which is the one that's sinking there, um, had a decade and a half of stealing fish. And Sea Shepherd said, you know what? We're sick of governments not doing anything about these guys. They're right there. Everyone knows about them. No one stops them. We're going to go out and find the seven purple listed vessels, wherever they are in the world, and we're going to chase them. And we're just going to chase them. And we're going to raise holy hell every time they try to come into port. That was it. That was their goal. And literally, when the thought, when they kind of floated the idea within the maritime community, some people sort of rolled their eyes, like, good luck finding them. Within two weeks, Sea Shepherd in Antarctica 
found the thunder nets in the water. And how they did that's really interesting, to me at least. But um, they did it, and they began chasing them, and thus began a 10,000-mile chase that went from Antarctica to the coast of Africa. And it's like this epic cinematic story. You know, the thunder tried to shake their chasers by going through this really impossibly dangerous area of icebergs in Antarctica. Couldn't shake them. Two ships, the Bob Barker and the Sam Simon. I'm not making it up. Those are their names. Those are their benefactors. Um, these ships just chased them. They went through a Category 5 storm. We have footage on the website of the insane conditions. Couldn't shake them. Tried to outrun them. At one point, the, the Sea Shepherd guys, the Thunder guys needed food. Well, we don't know why they did it, but they put nets back in the water. And the Sea Shepherd guys said, we're taking your nets. And they went up, they took their nets, put them on board. The Thunder captain, we have the audio of it. He's a Chilean, I speak Spanish, so I've listened to it. But he, you know, profanity-laden pissed and says, we're coming after you. So for six straight hours, the Thunder chased the Sea Shepherd guys. <laughs> Right? So it's just like, you can't make these stories. So I was like, I'm not sure I can live up to the story. You know, I don't even have to get the story. I just have to write it. So this was this great story. And, it, and again, it fit perfectly in my conceptual umbrella of like, you know, lawlessness um, out in the void. And I left you know, and headed home thinking, wow, how can I get that into 5,000 words or less? I'm on, I'm in Amsterdam or somewhere. I can't remember where, but a layover. I get a call, you're not going to believe what's happening with the thunder. And I thought, like, the story is already dramatic enough. And I left before it had culminated because it was going on and on and on, and, like, it wasn't clear when they were going to stop running, and they might get refueled by some sketchy Nigerians that they're heading towards, and I was just like, this is going to go on forever. So I left. Get a call. You're not going to believe what's happening. The thunder's think sinking. And literally, I remember turning to the board the big board, you know, airports, and trying to figure out, can I get back to Ghana? Like, is there any way to get back to this? Um, obviously, I couldn't. It took days and days to get out there. But So the thunder ultimately sunk itself. The crew got off. The officers got off. Their record, ref, there were, what's the word? I'm having a stroke here. Um, they are rescued by um, the Sea Shepherd guys, taken to Sao Tome and Principe, handed over to the police. They've since been prosecuted, convicted. The officers looking at two years and $5 million. The, the crew just following orders, all Indonesians sent home. Um, but it, like that ending, I never would have predicted and is the perfect sort of capstone to the story because down with it, a mile and a half, went the evidence of their crimes. Now, they got prosecuted, so it ended in a way that often doesn't happen. But many of these stories end this way where when the jig is up, you just sink the evidence. Um, and it's very hard to prove things at sea. And that gets, again, to the difficulty of law enforcement at this, um, on these waters. So I'm going to like ungracefully and really abruptly stop there. Um, there are about four other stories in the series. Um, but I think it's better just to open it up to Q&A, and we can talk. So thanks. You got there first. Uh, yeah, th thanks for writing these. I, I really enjoyed them. Uh, I, I spent a lot of uh, time on small boats in nice neighborhoods, so mm -hmm. I, I have a hard time kind of thinking of, of a world where I see a lot of kindness and people will help you if you're in trouble and so mm -hmm. on. With this, is it really a matter of bad neighborhoods or have I just been sheltered? I mean, what do you think? It's a good question. So, I mean, it's such in a huge space, right, that most of what happens out there, in my view, is people stay away from each other by design, by decision, or just by the nature of how big it is. Um, so the bad stuff isn't um, all the time everywhere. You know, It's not packed in. Um, at the same time, what struck me wasn't the frequency. It was the impunity. Um, and so um, I wouldn't try to put a number. We did with the violence story, and we crunched all sorts of data and um, tried to get some estimates on how often that stuff happens. And the numbers are pretty striking. Um, take a look at that story. Um, and, and what we had was very partial. Um, but what I will say is there are some places in the world and some you know, orders of vessels um, where it's a really brutal place. So I would say, if you're looking to find bad stuff, um, go get a job on a Taiwanese tuna longliner. Um, 
or um, many of these motherships that service the third world. Um, uh, the the um, the discipline that's exerted on the crew and what happens on those boats is um, pretty severe. Um, so I don't think it's just where you are. I also think it's the type of vessel you're on. Yeah, uh, thanks for writing that series. I really enjoyed it. Um, so the sea has historically been like a place of both uh, danger and criminality, but also adventure. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, uh, the fact that in this day and age it still exists as like a wild west of lawlessness, um, obviously you've exposed a lot of the horrible stuff that goes on out there. Is there any tinge of romance left to mm. it, that there's you know an ungoverned place left on Earth? Yeah, I think you put it really gracefully. Um, and it is something that I give short shrift to because sort of by nature of my beat, I'm supposed to focus on what's broken. You know, my, I have a 12 year old and he's always like, dad, another negative story, you know, why can't you? <laughs> I'm like, this is what I do, you know. Um, uh, so just to riff on what you said, there's this notion of mare liberum, which is sort of you know, in some ways a conceptual um, precursor to international law, and this um, Dutch lawyer named Grotius kind of came up with it. And it was kind of um, what gave rise intellectually and legally to free trade. Um, and it, it had lots of components, one of which was, hey, look, guys, us governments that are starting to form, let's agree that um, we leave each other alone out in that space, the high seas area. And the 12 is interesting. It's a cannon shot. That's where that number originally came. So. Um, beyond the, you know, when people get too close and they can hit you with a cannon, that's national waters. But out beyond that, it's international waters. And let's have that be a kind of public space where we don't mess with each other. And let's all agree that those guys that do, the pirates, we will team up together to kick their ass. Like that's the core and really crass version of Mara Liberum. And it's also the core of just what you hint at, which is the romance, which is real. It's a beautiful space. It's an open space. It's it's um, it's uh, it's it's really kind of an embodiment of freedom, you know, because of its huge expanse. And it's also an essential space for commerce in the sense that um, part of the way that a designer on you know in New York can think up a new style of dress. And a week later, it's on a monitor in Taiwan. And a week after that, it's being mass produced in Bangladesh. And the dye is coming from Tokyo. And then it's in a container on a ship and headed back to New York for sale a week after that. Part of the way you can have rapid commerce is because there are no checkpoints and toll booths on the high seas. Um, that's why 90% of commerce comes by way of sea because it's fast, relatively, not as fast as a plane, but and cheap and unfettered. Um, so from a philosophical point of view, it is a beautiful place. It's where people go historically and presently to get away from governments and to get away from people. Um, but it's also an economic through way that, because it's lawless, um, is essential to globalized markets. Um, and, you know, obviously I didn't spend much time on that, but I do really think um, you're right. So I know this is kind of going against your, uh, I was going to bring up a point that was against your editorial uh, dictate, but in addition to all of these bad issues of slavery on the high seas and violence and brutality and everything else, there's also sort of the environmental issues of their, you know, them using bunker fuel, which is with mm -hmm. also with like no scrubber systems whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So like one really big ship could put out as much pollution as like all the cars in New York City. Mm -hmm. So like what's the point of, you know, fixing things on land if the ships are so polluting? Mm -hmm. So just with all those issues and it, you know, it tinges on like human rights and the environment and everything, can anything actually be done to solve these problems or is there anything that's going to be done? Or is it just permanently kind of a lawless land and, you know, let it be? Um, Yes, a lot can and already is, and each day I think is more being done um, on the environmental front. And I would think that um, there are two different categories of environmental concerns, right? There's above water and below water. So above water, like you say, the type of fuel that's burnt is really, really um, polluting, um, and there are large quantities of it. Um, uh, 
and below water, you know, technology has meant that fishing has become more like industrial harvesting and less like, um, you know, fishing. You know, in other words, uh, um, so you have bigger ships, more effective ships, um, better sonar, better GPS. You know, it's a glass top table now, and you can see everything down below. Um, and so what that has meant in the last three decades, and if you would jump to the Palau story, it's the very last story, Craig, um, the very last story. So the very last story, which I ended up going to the magazine to do, um, is the fish story. It's the environmental story. And it's about this tiny archipelago nation of Palau, which has the land mass of Philadelphia and the water space of France, and they have one ship and 18 men. And they, that country, Palau, has been more aggressive probably than any country in the world for lots of self-interested reasons. 50% of their GDP comes from tourism, and that's all water tourism. That's shark and coral. And, and they're in a rough neighborhood in terms of poachers near the biggest markets, both the biggest fleets and the biggest consumers of fish in the world are all around them. So you've got this amazing David and Goliath or Sisyphus story, whichever way you want to go. Um, and so I went, that's not their ship, thankfully. That's one of the ships they boarded, the one you're seeing. But um, I went for an embed with that kind of um, police force um, and sort of used it, synecdoche, as you know, sort of what might the world learn about um, the importance of getting a handle on um, how quickly we're depleting the ocean of its residents. Um, and um, what we can now, in the era of big data and drones and satellites, um, potentially do to um, police those waters. Um, and Google, you know, your employer, is actually in the story um, and is playing an important role um, on the big data front. You may already know about that. But um, so, um, so to answer your question, yeah, I think there's a lot that can be done. Um, I do think, like tech, technology in particular, um, uh, can. Uh, be a force for good um, in slowing technology's role in the force for bad. Um, uh, and um, I think also, you, you know, um, you have more awareness now of um, how all these things relate. Um, you know, Secretary Kerry said the other day, not to keep quoting him, um, but um, in an interview um, said, you know, look, our view is that the um, the chase story is the Lang Long story, or the illegal fishing story is the sea slavery story. These are integrated, connected stories, um, and that's the transshipment point. Um, the more desperate things get, the harsher things are going to get um, from a labor and human rights perspective, and also. Um, so um, I, I'm a little bit more hopeful than, um, than the series might imply. Someone else has got a question. Yeah. I mean, governments used to take a pretty active role. I mean, they would send ships out there and they'd hang everyone they, they brought in. Or if, you, if they caught you fishing where you weren't supposed to, they took your boat and they tossed you in jail. What are, they, you know, what are governments doing about these things now? It sounds like you're saying that they're largely abdicating their historical role. Well, so um, I'd come down in altitude a little bit. Um, I don't know if I can answer for governments writ large. It varies drastically, right? So in the case of Palau, there's this interesting exchange we had in the wheel room with the, those cops, um, and they were kind of looking at Indonesia, which has been, which has a fisheries manager, this woman named Susie, who's kind of um, really stepped up. And part of that is geopolitical, and it's Spratly related, and it's Indonesia flexing its muscle, saying, "You come in our waters, we're going to do something about it." Um, but part of it is genuinely concerned about human rights and environmental concerns. But Indonesia has taken a very aggressive role. They catch your boat, they burn it, they take you off, they send you home, and they burn your boat. Um, the Palauans looked over at the Indonesians were like, you know, they're cops, right? You know, these are macho guys, and they also, you know, want to succeed in their job like we all do. And they were seeing repeat flyers. Um, there's this funny anecdote, didn't make it in the story, but it made it in the second story about this, um, where these guys are, at the end of the day, pretty nice guys. Um, and they're sympathetic with the deckhands, who are just very poor kind of guys following orders on these poacher vessels. They're not getting rich from it. Not even the captain's getting rich. It's the owner. And so when they would arrest the poachers, they'd bring them back in, and they'd take a clothing donation um, from their families. 
and oftentimes the shirts that would end up in the donated box for the arrested deckhands would be campaign shirts. Why? Because they're cheap, they're free, you know, they're handed out each presidential. The Palauans were saying that like every couple months they would see these same deckhands on other boats with like elect Smith, you know, the Palauan candidate. These guys were Filipino or Taiwanese or whatever. And they were realizing these are repeat flyers and this is sort of really frustrating because we, are we really doing anything here? They're coming back and they're coming back. Um, but to answer your question, it, it ranges, you know, from really aggressive um, postures like Indonesia to really permissive postures like, you know, Seychelles and Fiji and that just, you know, you can do anything. Um, and the problem with maritime enforcement is it's insanely expensive. You need, to really do it, you either need help from big muscular institutions like Google and Oceana or the US government, US military, or if you're on your own, you know, you need boats and planes. And a lot of these countries that have the richest waters don't have, have boats and planes to be patrolling, so. Um, Hi, um, I sort of have a similar question on countries abdicating their, their role in a lot of this. Cause what I think is interesting is a lot of the headlines that we see other than these are stories about the South China Sea and how a lot of countries are aggressively trying to claim territory, ocean territory as, as their own for their own geopolitical interests. So I'm sort of curious from your perspective, in some ways it seems like they wouldn't want to abdicate this, this role because it shows that they have control over an area. So I'm curious if you looked into that part mm -hmm. of it at all or where that overlaps with what you were interested in. Yeah, so there are different things going on there, right? So you look at Spratly's, and for those who haven't been following it, which, um, you know, this is this um, area that's a contested area, and the Philippines lays claim, the Chinese lay claim, and others lay claim, and the Chinese are the big boys on the block, and they're building an island. <laughs> they're taking ownership. Um, possession is nine-tenths of the law, as they say. Um, and so the Chinese government has built um, an island where there wasn't one, and they have now a landing strip, and you know, they have soldiers on there and they're, why? It has nothing to do with fishing, it has to do with mineral rights. There's oil and there's gas and there's subsea minerals that are insanely valuable, much for the computers that we use, like rare earth stuff, but also oil and gas. And that's really what that's about. That's what Spratly's is about. And that's really where governments tend to um, flex muscle. Fishing isn't lucrative enough, generally speaking, for countries with big militaries or navies to um, care. Um, uh, mineral rights, now you're in big money. Um, so what you do have is um, symbolic clashes where it seems like it's over the fisherman who was shot by that other country. It's not really, it's about like something higher order, but it's playing out over that. Um, and so you have these clashes where, you know, the, the Vietnamese and, and the Indonesians and the, uh, even the Palauans and will arrest. Um, so, for example, with Palau, there's this bizarre incident where the Palauans um, were really, really frustrated. And they, there was this one atoll where they kept spotting this one set of poachers day in, day out. They chased them, these guys had souped up boats, they got away, they got away, they got away. And then finally, they went after them and they tried to shoot out their engines. And the, they say that bullets ricocheted off the engine. The guy had four bullet holes on him, but a Chinese deckhand was killed. And thus began this dramatic incident, which is in the story. But um, that spurred this huge, diplomatic row between China and Palau. Um, and it played out over fishing rights and mining rights and tourism subsidy dollars and all these other things. And the newspapers focused on the dead deckhand, but really had to do with much bigger things. Um, so anyway, to answer your question, um, yeah, countries are exerting their um, jurisdictional claims uh, with their navies when there's a lot more at stake. Um, that doesn't usually play out on fishing level. I can talk about this forever. You guys have a job to get back to, so any other questions? All right, well, thanks for coming.